Hello, everyone. Welcome to our ongoing series of the Leger Academic Committee uh, webinar presentations. This week, we have Dr. Chuck Chakrapani. Uh, Chuck, if you don't know Chuck, we always like to say, um, not only did Chuck, uh, is he a, is a senior leader in the market research field, we, you like to say someone wrote a book on market research. Well, Chuck has written six, six books on market research. Um, and most recently just published his 20th book on uh, Stoic philosophy. He is a research methodologist, an educator, an expert witness, magazine and journal editor, and he is the president of Leger Analytics. He is also the distinguished visiting professor at the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University. Uh, so Chuck is gonna take us through uh, some disruptive technologies and talk about the future of where we're heading as a world, as an industry, as, a, uh, as everything around us. And uh, I will leave it to uh, the smartest person I know, Dr. Chuck Chakrapani. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. COVID-19 had a negative effect on most people's lives. Paradoxically, it also had a positive impact on technology. So technology has been growing at a breakneck speed in the past two years. And that is changing everything in our lives, the healthcare, banking, travel, housing, retail, manufacturing. So this talk is about how it's changing our lives. So most of my talk will not directly relate to marketing research, but towards the end, I'll talk about how these changes will affect marketing research and, the, and our profession. Now, whenever we want to find out what's going to happen in the future, the easiest way is to follow the money. Because whenever things change, people with money ask one question, how I can make even more money? So they move their money before anybody knows about it. So we always follow the money to find out what's going to happen. Now, let me talk about three items. Earlier this year, Bill Gates changed his portfolio. He sold 100% of his stakes in Microsoft, Amazon, Twitter, Apple, and Alibaba. Capped 50% of his stake in, in, in Google. Now, the question is, these are all good stocks. Why did he sell all this? Obvious answer is you can make even more money in some of those stocks. Item number two, 30 years ago, a 17 year old kid came to Montreal from South Africa looking for his uncle. He couldn't find his uncle there. So he moved to Saskatchewan to live with his mother. Then he enrolled himself in, at Queen's University and studied there for two years and moved to the States. 20 years later, he was the richest man in the world. I'm talking about Elon Musk. So what does Elon Musk invest in? In, in, in PayPal, the financial technology, and in electronic vehicle, artificial intelligence, all disruptive technologies. And when he became the richest man in the world, what did he do? He invested one and a half billion in Bitcoins, once again, a new disruptive technology. Item number three, about seven years ago, a little known 60 year old economist started an exchange traded mutual fund called ARK. Within five years, she became a superstar of investing. She became one of the 100 richest women entrepreneurs, has 1 million followers on in Twitter, and she has an estimated net worth of half a billion dollars. Once again, what does she invest in? To invest in disruptive technology. But what are these disruptive technologies? They are technologies fueled by artificial intelligence like DNA sequencing, immunotherapy, blockchain, mobile devices, energy storage, autonomous mobility. For convenience sake, we can divide them into seven categories in healthcare, fueled by DNA and genome, financial technology, Internet of Things, energy storage, autonomous vehicle, robotics, and 3D printing. Now, if you look at human economic history, there are three major revolutions. 
one was the industrial revolution where we went with steam engines, railways, planes, electricity, radio, telephone, automobiles, television, all those things were invented. But that went on for 150 to 200 years. Although the effect was huge, it was spread over 150 years, so it did not change the world immediately. Then came personal computers and internet. This revolution, this digital revolution happened within 25 to 30 years. So its effects was much bigger than that of the industrial revolution. Now we are in the midst of a third revolution, which is driven by artificial intelligence, AI, which includes deep learning, robotics, autonomous driving, genome sequencing, energy storage, blockchain, FinTech, 3D printing. This is going to happen within the next five or 10 years, and this effect is going to be huge. Now, when I was talking about this to, to Audrey in our office in Montreal, she being much younger than me suggested five, five to 10 years is too long. Nobody cares about five or 10 years. You should talk about what is happening now. She has a point. So I've decided that I'm going to be talking about only about what is happening now or about to happen. I'm not going to be talking about prototype or speculate what might happen in five or 10 years. So before doing that, I'd like to talk, uh, take about five minutes to talk about machine learning because all these things are fueled by artificial intelligence and machine learning. Traditionally, this is what we did. We had data and we fed it to machine learning. And machine learning did one of the two things. Either it predicted certain things, whether certain whether a customer would buy a product or not, or it grouped people, people who are who had similar attitudes or similar demographics. It did just these two things and variations of these two things. But all these things were coded by humans. That means a human brain has to write a program, write codes for the machine to do these things. The greatest innovation in machine learning has happened in the past 10 years. There are two, two other types of machine learning. One is called reinforced learning. The other one is deep learning. Here, the machine writes its own code. Human beings don't write code, machine writes its own code. Let me give you an example. Suppose you are trying to teach a robot to jump between edge of one surface and the edge of another surface. If it fails, in, in ordinary circumstances, human beings would write a code, change the program to make sure it does it properly. If it doesn't work, you do it again and again and again and you succeed. In reinforcement learning, the computer itself knows that it, it did not succeed in this task. So it'll revise its code. If it doesn't work, it'll revise its code again and again and again. So it can do it thousands of times before it succeeds. Human beings are not involved, so it is cheaper and it is much more efficient. The other form is called deep learning. It is even more complicated. For example, if you look at this picture, most of us can distinguish which are men's spaces and which are women's spaces. How do we do this? Although we can do it, we'll find it hard to describe to somebody else how we can distinguish a man's face from a woman's face. So that means when we learn, when you teach a computer, we have to tell the computer exactly how a man's face is different from a woman's face. Since we, we are not quite sure how we do this, we find it hard to teach the computer. In deep learning, we don't instruct the computer at all. What we do is we give a million uh, photographs of women's spaces, just labeled as women's space, similarly men's space. And then we give to the computer these millions of photographs. The computer itself figures it out, what makes a woman's space a woman's space and a man's face is a man's face. This is a huge, huge development in artificial learning, artificial intelligence. Last year, when the COVID was in its height, a revolutionary AI was introduced. It's called GPT-3. GPT-3 is based on deep learning. 
it can diagnose diseases, it can talk to you as a therapist, it can design web pages, it can translate languages, it can write emails, it can code in a dozen different languages, it can retrieve historical facts, it can do all this. But as I promised, I'm not going to talk about what it can do, let me talk about what it has done in the past year. It has identified a molecule with antibiotic properties. This is huge because for human beings to identify a molecule with antibiotic properties will take a team of scientists and doctors and will take years because it is not easy to do that because of thousands of molecules and to human beings have to go through it one by one trying to find different properties. But deep learning uh, algorithm of AI can, has identified already a molecule with antibiotic properties. It has managed to detect breast cancer earlier than doctors. It has predicted hypoglycemia in diabetics, predicted heritable conditions. And in simulated games, AI fighter pilots have outdone human pilots. Another artificial intelligence program, program is called DeepMind, used by Google. Google has the best engineers in the world. So it has many data centers and it employs its engineers to reduce the energy consumption. After having, after the engineers have reduced energy consumption by the data centers, artificial intelligence was brought in to see if further savings can be done. The, the AI program reduced the cost by further 40%. This means that is even if we have the best engineers, AI can still improve upon it. Now, GPT-3 can do more than that. GPT was given the task of writing a poem in the style of Dr. Seuss of the dispute between Elon Musk and SEC. This is what it came up with. The SEC said, Musk, your tweets are a blight. They really could cost you your job if you don't stop all this tweeting at night. Then Musk cried, why? The tweets I wrote are not mean. I don't use all caps and I'm sure my tweets are clean. But your tweets can move markets and that's why we are so. You may be a genius and a billionaire, but that doesn't give you the right to be a bore. For this, this is written by a computer. For a computer to do this, first it has to understand the type of tweets that Elon Musk writes. It has to understand the dispute between Elon Musk and SEC. It has to understand how Dr. Seuss writes. And so far, if you are, those of you who have followed Google Translate, you will see that if it is a standard thing, it will get everything right. But if it's a literature of sarcasm, it cannot get it right. So what we are seeing here is artificial intelligence understanding almost like a human being. So what does it mean in real life? Here is a legal document which says, Upon the liquidity, upon liquidation of the company, the series A shareholders will receive in preference to all share stakeholders and amount in respect of each series, blah, blah, blah. It goes on for several lines. If I fail to understand this, I need to read two or three times. So we give it to GPT-3 and say, what does it say? This is what GPT comes up with. If the startup is wound up, the series A investors will be paid back what they invested. They will also share any leftover assets with ordinary shareholders. So what you have, it's a simple explanation in plain English, what the late list says. Similarly, it can be a medical diagnosis aid given the symptoms and what the medicine was administered. GPT can understand what, what the type of medicine and the reason why that medicine was administered. Here is AI in action. What you see on the right hand side is a real person. She is American, she doesn't know any Japanese. But she had to give a talk in Japanese. 
So she uses an AI. This is by Azure Microsoft. The AI translates her speech into Japanese, and AI also identifies her mannerisms, the way she speaks, and delivers the talk in Japanese that is on the right side. It's a hologram, and that it gives a realistic version of what she would have said if she had known Japanese. So only if you, GPT-3 is 10 times as powerful as the previous generation of AI, which was, which, which was created in 2019, which was in, in effect in 2019. 2019, AI could handle 17.5 billion parameters. In 2020, AI could handle 175 billion parameters, just tenfold as powerful. If we thought that is, that, that, that's huge, watch this. Beijing Academy of Artificial Intelligence has come out this year, something called Udao, another AI, which is 10 times as powerful as GPT-3. That means in two years, our artificial intelligence has become 100 times as powerful. It's, it, is, it is going at such a breakneck speed. And Google presented a switch, pro, switch per transformer. It's a, a neural net, a new neural net that can create larger models without increasing the cost. But all this is all well and good, but none of this will have any impact unless consumer adopts it, they, it, they, they start using it. For that to happen, we need two things to happen, had to happen. One is the cost has to decline. There's no point in creating a cure for cancer if it costs a million dollars because there is no way anybody can use it. So it has to be a declining cost curve. And secondly, commercially it should be viable to produce, so companies should be producing. So let me let's review some of these areas I talked about and see whether the, how much the cost is coming down and whether, whether these are being produced commercially. Like first computing. What you see here is a computer that you can create this afternoon in Microsoft Azure. And this, this will always be your computer. You can put all your programs in here and you have all your stuff in here. And it will always have be the latest computer because that will be changed automatically by Microsoft. And it will be secured by Microsoft so you don't have any security concern. How big is it? It can be as big as you want to be or as small as you want to be. And how much does it cost? It's free unless you use it. When you use it, you will use it only for the amount you use. If you have a huge problem, you'll pay more. If it's a small problem, you'll pay practically nothing. Basically, it costs pennies an hour, and it, you can create it for free. Now, storage. In, in 1995, one meg storage costed $100. In 2020, five meg store, online storage, you can have it for free. So that means what would have cost half a million dollars, if it was available in 1995, costs nothing now. AI training costs, it has come down by 37% last year alone. A week ago, on November 30th, Amazon introduced what is known as SageMaker 2. Here, it is no code computing. If you have big data, you can just load it at SageMaker. You can point and click what you want to do with it. And SageMaker will go through, understand you the type of data you have, and then use different models and create the best model that is available. And you don't have to write any code. You don't have to know machine learning. Machine learning is done by Amazon um, SageMaker. So as you can see, the cost of computing has gone down has gone down dramatically, cost of A has gone down dramatically, and machine learning, you can do point and play. That's what's happening in the world of computing. Now, 
what's happening in medicine. In medicine, now given, now we have next generation of DNA sequencing, artificial intelligence, synthetic biology. That means you can put all the data about, about a patient in a machine learning model, it will detect whether a person will have cancer in the future or it will be cancer free. And this thing, the cost of multi-cancer screening is now less than a thousand dollars. It is moving towards hundred thousand dollars. That means a cancer can be detected much earlier than it was, than we could about five or 10 years ago. And the cost is a fraction of what it would have cost about five or 10 years ago. Then the next field is personalized medicine, where up until now, if I have cancer, if somebody else has cancer, we pretty much got the same treatment. If I had migraine, somebody else had the same, we got pretty much the same treatment. But now because of genome sequencing, based on your predicted response or risk of disease, you will get a different prescription compared to somebody else. This, is, this has become possible because of genome sequencing. The cost of genome sequencing in 2006 was $14 million. Now it is under $1,500. So we'll have all personalized medicine. Each person will be prescribed a different medicine depending on that person's condition. So if you look back 10 years from now, the medicine we are practicing today, probably it looks very primitive that everybody got more or less the same medicine. Okay. In COVID, we saw the vaccine came into the market in about a year. Usually vaccines take several years before it can come to the market. Once again, the, pro the reason why this happened was that AI played a major part in that. So we'll see in medicine, the advances are fast and furious and the costs are coming down very rapidly. The next area is 3D printing. It is a house in Calverton, New York. This went on sale a few months ago. The cost of this house was 300,000 and it came with a 50 year warranty. All the houses around it are at least 600,000 or two or three times more than the, the cost of this house. Of this house. The reason why this house was stronger and cheaper was this was built using the 3D printing technology. 3D printing technology makes everything cheaper and it's faster. It's so fast. This house was built in less than a week. So it can be built, a house like this built like this very fast. In fact, these are low cost housing, about 650 square foot, and at the cost, built at a cost of 4,000. Houses like these are built to replace slums in places like El Salvador and Mexico right now. It's happening around the world. In El Salvador and Mexico, it's mostly for low cost housing, but in US, Australia, Europe, and Asia, they are used to build regular houses. In Dubai, actually, they are planning to build a skyscraper using 3D technology. So 3D printing can be used to create all sorts of prototypes, machinery, manufacturing, automobiles, spare parts, healthcare equipment, supplies, plastic products, footwear, semiconductors. So the all will reduce the manufacturing costs. So as you can see, 3D printing, once again, is going to reduce the cost of building, building the cost of spare parts, the cost of machinery and furniture. The next area is robotics. The, the, the robotics is being used more and more in manufacturing. This curve shows it is growing exponentially. In fact, one out of four employees in Amazon is a robot. One out of eight employees in automotive industry is a robot, and it's going to grow even faster. And so in manufacturing and in overall, it's not very high because robotic is still in its infancy, but it is, it's growing 
in use. In fact, robotic delivery, you can deliver anything within a two miles radius for about 40 cents using robotic delivery. Uh, you can also use drones for delivery. In fact, Google is testing in Australia. About 100,000 deliveries were done using ro robots. And it, once again, it cost, cost of delivery is about 40 cents, so it can, it, can, it can be in a beach, and if you suddenly have a merge to have cappuccino, you a few taps on your smartphone, next 15 minutes, you've got your cappuccino delivered at a cost of 40 cents for the delivery. Amazon Prime Air is planning to deliver five uh, packages under five pounds within 30 minutes using drones. Then there are firefighting drones. Once again, the drones have been known for a long time, but they were too expensive for firefighting purposes. Now the costs have come down so much. They are used for fighting, for firefighting in high-rise buildings, also put out forest fires in, in the US and uh, bushfires in Australia. Then these are also equipped with AI. That means they can not only put out fires, they can also identify whether there are any human beings trapped within a building. And hopefully robots can rescue them that we don't have to risk human, be human lives like firefighters to put out fire or even to um, or rescue human beings. And what's saying is all these are possible because the drones have become autonomous. Previously, they were remotely controlled. Compared to that, autonomous drones is 97% cheaper. Remotely piloted, piloted drones cost $7.80 for a 10-mile flight. Autonomous drones cost only 25 cents. What you see here is a house uh, built once again by, ro by a robot. The robot is only one arm robot, just it has one arm, and it has only one operator. This builds a house in, I think this was built in four and a half days. A complete house is built in four and a half days using one, one operator and one robot. This house is stronger and better because a drone can lift a much heavier um, brick and place it at the correct position. So this is happening. This this particular one is done by an Australian company. Uh, this one, this, the, this example is from Perth, Australia. Then we have electronic vehicle and automatic, autonomous driving. If you find a regular uh, car such as Camry, its cost has been fairly steady it's at $26,000. The reason being there is no way it cost can come down because there is nothing that, uh, that can reduce the cost. Electronic vehicle, on the other hand, was, what was 50,000 about two years ago. Now it's about 39,000 and it is going down. The reason why that happens is that we have the biggest cost in electronic vehicles, the lithium batteries. And that price has come down in the past 30 years from $7,500 to $150 now. And it is still going down. So we have electronic vehicles, which are cheaper. Now, autonomous vehicles are also here. And these, te all Tesla models created after 2019 are autonomous vehicles. That means you can take your hands off the of the steering wheel and it'll get you to your destination. Once once you get to your destination, you can get out of the car, it'll, it'll go and park itself. And then you can use your smartphone to hail it back. And all these things are available now. Of course, they can call it autonomous cars because legally uh, they are not allowed to. But basically they are very close to being autonomous, drive themselves, park themselves, and uh, you can hail them anytime you want. The interesting thing is the, the cost of driving has been 70 cents in 2020 dollars all these years. 
that means till the model t came out since the model t came out until today um, on inflation adjusted basis the cost has been the same 70 cents a mile but the electronic vehicle is going to bring down the cost to 20 cents a mile so that means it is for the first time the cost of driving will be a third of what it has been all these years uh, not only that if you have autonomous ride sharing that means you, you have like uber uber can charge you a dollar a mile and make a handsome profit whether they will or not i don't know but the cost is so low now uh, autonomous driving could be much much cheaper than it is now okay. financial technology here once again the great change the figures I'm going to talk about, unfortunately, is mostly U.S. because I don't have any Canadian or even international figures. But here's what we are finding. Investors who started trading um, in the, during the time of COVID is 26%. This is huge. We are saying 26% of the people who are trading now were not in the market just about two years ago. So who are these people? Many of them are young people who just have a few hundred dollars. Now, the new financial technology by Robin Hood and things like that makes it easier for them to trade, even if they only have a few hundred dollars. They can keep making trade options and keep making money. So these are all taking the power away from traditional um, brokerage houses. And if you look at banks, once again, banks are losing their power for uh, Morgan Chase, it took for 31 years to get 60 million customers. It, it took five mergers and 30 years. But uh, fintech apps like the Cash App or Venmo, they are getting they developed each one 60 million uh, customers in less than 10 years. So that means they are taking customers away from banks. And banks have already lost about 10% of credit card interest because it's not going through them anymore. And bank and also bank banks costs are getting higher because they're they're caught, they are brick and mortar places. So they keep bank branches. The costs have gone up by 25%, but the utility utility has gone down by 75%. Next is Bitcoin challenges. Many corporations and governments accept Bitcoin as payments. Once again, it diminishes the role of banks in controlling the money. So this is how this our world is changing. And everywhere, the costs are coming down. Things are getting better. So what does it mean to us? What are, what are, what's the implication of these things to our, um, to our profession? Many years ago, when I joined marketing research, clients wanted everything faster, better, and cheaper. Several years later, it is still the same. They want faster, better, and cheaper. But when I started out, we couldn't give faster, better, and cheaper. We will say faster, better, and cheaper take two. If it is faster and better, it can be cheaper. If it is better and cheaper, it can be faster, and so on. The reason for that is we didn't tell the technology for all three to happen at the same time. But the things have changed now. Now, as we saw, we can have cheaper, faster, and better healthcare, cheaper, faster, and better housing, cheaper, faster, and better transportation, cheaper, faster, better manufacturing, cheaper, faster, better banking. All these things are happening. So when this happens, what's going to happen to us? Will our jobs disappear? Whenever there is, my guess is no. Whenever there is innovation, many jobs disappear. When cars came into being, horse drawn cars disappeared. Many lost their jobs. When electricity came into being, lantern and gaslight manufacturers lost their jobs. When computer came into being, secretarial jobs and typing pools have disappeared. Still, now as many people are employed as ever. So I don't believe the jobs will disappear. They will change, but they won't disappear. 
Now, if you look at the size of the global marketing research industry, it ranges from 45 to 75 billion dollars, growing approximately at 5% a year. The US and Canada account for a third of the global figure. But the big growth is not in traditional marketing research. Traditional marketing is growing, but not as fast as technology. In fact, there are many technology companies are offering marketing research by proxy. If you look at user experience, for example, user experience is a traditional area of traditional marketing research. But now the companies that are offering user experience are more like Qualtrics or Medallia, which are not marketing research companies, but technology companies. But they are offering what marketing research companies used to offer. So this is how currently marketing research looks. We are in the area where insights are provided by human beings. And there is a huge technology-driven marketing research. They also provide insights. Like, as I said, Qualtrics, Medallia, Alida, and companies like that. So what happens? Because the profit margins and in insights industry in human driven industry is going down and it's not going as fast as insights in tech driven industries where profit margins are increasing so in in, the, in this framework what is your future basically what's happening is there is uh, i i believe insight driven in uh, tech driven Marketing is also profit is going to go down. After a while, it's stabilized. It won't be as high as it is now. Um, so it is not the profit is neither in insights, human-driven insights, or tech-driven insights. Where the main profit is going to be, or main growth is going to be, is the overlap between tech-driven insights and human-driven insights. I think that's where leisure is going. We, we are keeping our insight, human driven insight, and adding tech driven insight. So this is where I think the future is. I think this is I think this is where Leger is going. But by and large, a lot of what I'm saying is speculation. Like for the past five years, three major figures, Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of State, and um, Eric Schmidt, who is the who was a former chairman of Google, and um, Dan Hattelocker, who is the who is the, who is the MIT dean of computing, have been periodically getting together to to discuss the impact of AI that's going to happen, and they came up last month with a book called The Age of AI, and that they say the outcome of AI will be the alteration of human identity and experience of human reality at levels not experienced since the dawn of modern age. This is strong stuff. All they are saying is our human identity will change. Our experience of human reality will change at levels not experienced since the dawn of modern age. So we are in for a wild ride. All I can say is fasten your seat belts. Next five, years, five or 10 years will be nothing like what it is now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuck. That was uh, that's that's an incredible look into this. Uh, for anyone who's on the line, there is on your right hand side of the screen a questions tab. Uh, feel free to uh, connect and ask a question. We've got a few minutes for questions here. I, Chuck, and I think it relates to this last piece about about how the human identity and the experience of human re reality will change at levels that we've never experienced. And I go back earlier on where you. You got a slide that showed how technology, how long it took technology to change, and then digital change, and now mm -hmm. AI change. Um, and I'm thinking of some of our clients in the government and mm -hmm. that we work with on public policy and research around that, because we're changing, innovation is changing much faster than we're adopting this, or that we're able to adopt it. Yeah. To what degree does this become a policy issue? Like for example, yesterday, there was a Toronto committee called on the ban on robots from sidewalks and bike paths because it affects people who have 
accessibility uh, issues for vision, mobility, and all the rest if there's robots running around yeah. delivering packages. So at the same time that technology is moving us and disrupting our lives and moving us forward, we're holding back a bit. So how do we basically unleash the potential of this? What should, what should governments be looking at? The government, I think we don't know what they should be looking at, but there's always alternative technology. Let's say the sidewalk robots, it can, but, but you have drones. Okay, there's yeah. always some alternatives. And um, the reason why it's hard to say what they should be looking at, we don't know what shape this is all going to take. It's already happening, all happening simultaneously. Another, uh, it, it is, it's an even broader problem than policy issues. Uh, uh, let's say the, all these technologies can be misused. Okay, you just say 3D printing, you can buy, you can sell, a, you can uh, build a house for half the price, but you can also build illegal arms. You can buy a 3D thing and use illegal, uh, illegal weapons and it can be traced and you, you have drones to fight fire if you if you have been watching news last month a drone was used to attack iraqi uh, chief minister things like that happen so we don't know how we are going to handle but there are always so the question has to be specific and it has to be it has to be handled at that time so the thing is if, if you have specific questions like what do we do with the the sidewalk robots we can't have it sure you can have a robot that can uh move like a car maybe on on, on the roads or alternatively you can use drone delivery so it has to be it, every specific it has to be specific in the future the questions so a specific technology answers could be delivered okay and, and do you see current industry changing so you talk about banks and you talk about the how long it took morgan stanley to reach a certain level and how these other organizations are doing it so quickly um is it new organizations that will drive this change forward or because the old ones like we're still talking about how to keep coal around for crazy yeah. sake um so our old technology people going to hang on to that and slow us down and it's the new organizations that will drive us forward i think it's a new will drive us forward because the old organizations are saddled with um, with older technology and many many other problems it is i believe it, it's a new one but if, let me give you an example like you know ai deep learning now they are they are developing deep learning chips chips that is pre-programmed so it's, it can it can deep learn now intel is lagging behind intel was a leader in chips for all these years now they are lagging behind they are in danger of losing their leadership because other technology companies are ahead so it's not so much as whether you're an older company or a newer company are you reacting how how you are reacting to what is happening uh, or to go our own to our own example there are many uh, companies in all type of marketing research human driven but leisure is one of the very few companies which moving towards where where things are going yeah so it's not the older company versus newer company um, it is companies which is in the right place at the right time or or work with Dr. Chuck Chakrapani so we know the right direction to go. So thank you. Um, w one of the questions is around obsolescence and mm -hmm. the likelihood that people have to, and let's like, for example, let's look at vehicles, the autonomous car. Um, yeah. This is where we're at right now. Technology is changing so fast. Maybe next year it's something different and the year after it's something different. Are we yeah. gonna move where people are now being forced to change more often? because um, what they bought this year is obsolete within six months. Yeah, but it is not a, you, you don't really have to let us see them. There is a major shift from, between gas driven and electronic vehicle because electronic vehicle now you can, it is much cheaper and uh, much less polluting. Now it can, let's say the battery gives you 350 miles today. The latest model will give you 450 miles. But do you really need 450 miles? You know, if you want, you can buy it. 
but it is not a from now on the it won't be it'll be a, for a while once a qualitative difference is done between uh, autonomous vehicle and trailer vehicle between uh, gas driven and uh, electric vehicle afterwards what happens after that is uh, basically quantitative difference and moreover um, it's also can be done the the model can be upgraded because it's all ai driven um, so you don't have to change your vehicle all you need to do is to uh, without changing your vehicle all you have to do is uh, change the programming which can be done yeah. remotely so it, it it depends but by and large that one i don't think that to be a okay um, here's I, I really like this question. Could AI theoretically become a guardrail for other AI systems? Oh, did we lose you, Chuck? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 We're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, could AI theoretically become a guardrail for other AI systems? Oh, now this is this is a fascinating thing because I had I, I had prepared my talk, but I it was going to be too long no it, it it's not not a guardrail because maybe but who decides what's a guardrail because this is the there's a danger in ai it can become uh, at the moment AI is becoming intelligence become on par with human beings but a doesn't have conscience it doesn't have morality it's not a sentient being that means it can be used for negative purposes as easily as it can be used for positive purposes. So if you, have, if you use as a guardrail, you're really talking about someone writing, someone creating an AI that acts as a guardrail, but someone else creates some other AI which, which can negate it. So no, it, it is one of the major problems. Just um, Stephen Hawking died about three years ago. And before he died, he said it's the biggest existential threat is AI. That's pretty strong stuff. And when he said that AI was, yes, yeah, now 100 times as strong as when he said that. And uh, Elon Musk also says it's the biggest ex existential threat. So we don't know whether it, uh, I mean, they are, what they are saying is extreme. They are saying it can extinguish human human race. I don't know if it can or not. But people who are saying it are not low-level people. People, people who have great experience with AI. So uh, we don't know. We don't know. But I don't see it acting as a guardrail because it can it can act as a guardrail. But who who decides what the guardrail is? Where it should be? Yeah. Um, this is going to be the last question, uh, and I'm going to read it out because I think it's uh, it. it needs to be read the way it is. These disruptive technologies require access to significant amounts of capital. Can you comment on how this will exacerbate the digital divide in local communities and among, mm -hmm. and among more or less developed economies? Yes, uh, it, this, it, this is true. These are not cheap technologies, I was here. but uh, the things I'm talking about, like Amazon's SageMaker or the Azure's computer, they are scalable so you don't have to have a huge investment to begin with so the digital divide in my view will narrow for example the um, 3d printing for house it was i was surprised one of the earliest houses was built was in chennai in india because they have access to technology these technologies are not expensive and they are scalable so if you are um, let, let's say uh, development of drugs. Now, US has great resources, so they can have doctors, engineers, and people working on things, spending billions of dollars to develop a drug. Now, that can be done using AI in, uh, in the Philippines or some other country, because it is, it is doable, the, the cost is high, but not when it is shared when it, with the cloud computing, and um, and scalable um, AI, it is doable. So the digital divide will narrow. Once again, that is my view. It's not going to 
increase, but it's going to decrease. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Chuck. This was a, a very uh, interesting and uh, based on the questions, uh, thought-provoking discussion. Um, everyone else who was on today, uh, thank you very much for being here today and listening to this. We will uh, take a break for the holidays and we will be back in February. So the second Wednesday in February with Dr. Terry Flynn from McMaster University. And we will talk about uh, crisis and how to uh, manage crisis and how measurement and research plays into that. Uh, we'll be following that up with uh, Dr. Nani McDonald from uh, Dalhousie University. We're going to talk about disinformation and um, how disinformation and misinformation has changed uh, when it comes to vaccine hesitancy prior to the pandemic and now, where we're at now. Uh, then we'll have Dr. Daniel Voth from the University of Calgary, and we're going to come in and talk about uh, more specific to a measurement of Indigenous populations and how do we design research that uh, in, involves uh, all aspects of our society and make sure that people can answer the questions and that they're represented within the research that we do. And then um, Guy LaChapelle will join us and talk about the World Values Survey and Canada's place uh, and how that's changed over the last few years as well. So. Thank you very much again. For those of you who are online that work with Leger, we have a, a special private session with Chuck to ask additional questions uh, at one o'clock. So please log back into the Leger link. For everyone else, thank you very much. Have a great day and uh, great holidays and rest of the uh, de rest of December.